Right then. So, when you run an organisation that's as big as International Rescue, and, you know, as important as International Rescue, I expect you have to be prepared for pretty much everything, but I don't think anything could prepare them for this episode. In this episode, they have to save a group of people, not from an earthquake, or a volcano, or a typhoon, but from a swarm of giant alligators. Giant alligators? Giant alligators? In a strange homage to B-movies, almost, this episode follows a um, group of people in Louisiana who are trapped in their home by giant mutated alligators, and it's up to International Rescue to save them from it. The story goes behind this is that these group of people are um, scientists who are trying to find this new growth hormone because uh, the whole world is facing some sort of, sort of food shortage, so this growth hormone will help produce some even bigger animals that would feed more people. I mean, it's not like they're trying to find like some kind of you know, alternative to uh, eating animals, but, well, growth is more than better. Yeah, there's a um, very special plant, that, a very special weed, if you will, that grows mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in that part of the swamp, and they harvest that weed to get the growth hormone out. And, you know, they've tested it on... Probably in one of the more impressive, um, that's one of the great things about this episode. It showcases this great talent for, um, like, you know, scale. They um, show that they've tested the drug already on rabbits, and they show a couple of little rabbits who've been left, normal-sized rabbits in this case, who've been fed nothing but, you know, lettuce. And then they show the rabbits that have been fed the growth hormone, and they're almost bursting out of their cages. So it was a great use of scale. And obviously later on, when the formula accidentally gets spilled into the swamp, we're treated to some great, you know, trick photography when we see the alligators smashing up the house. It's a real uh, episode for all you animal lovers out there, and apparently this episode did uh, get investigated, didn't it, because of uh, animal cruelty or something? Yeah, that's right. Now, Attack of the Alligators was already arguably the most memorable episode of um, Thunderbirds because of this strange, strange premise, but it was also the most notorious because it got investigated by um, the RSPCA for um, the treatment that the reptiles were subjected to. Now, apparently, um, you know, you've heard stories on the internet of how they used, like, electric sticks to um, provoke the animals into, you know, doing the stuff that they, they were supposed to film them doing. And apparently they kept them in quite bad conditions. You know, crocodiles and alligators, like the ones used in the show, are cold-blooded animals, and yet they were kept in the tanks that weren't properly suited to um, how they were supposed to be taken care of. So, you know, some pretty controversial stuff behind the scenes. It's certainly not something you'd see on television today. I mean, with all the uh, health and safety risks and everything, which is completely understandable if you're someone who actually likes animals. Mm. And it's also interesting how they use the different scales. Like when you see these alligators attacking the boat, uh, which uh, supposedly uh, kills the man who wants to uh, steal this hormone and get it on the market first. But uh, eventually there's a bit of a twist and he ends up taking Scott hostage as Scott uh, comes down to uh, try and find out what's going on in the house. But this is an interesting uh, episode because uh, you see, it's the first one we see where all four of the Tracy brothers get uh, involved in it. And I say four because John is still up there in uh, the uh, in Thunder John Red does Fire. about as much in this episode as he does in any other episode. But yeah. I think this would be one instance where he's happy to mm. sit this one out. He'd yes. be like, you know, I'm glad it's my duty up in Thunder Farm. I don't want to go fighting any giant alligators. Yes, whereas Alan seems all the more up to it. Because this is an episode that seems to belong to Alan. Because in the opening scenes we see that he is pretty good at uh, fixing electrics. Because he's fixing the satellite dish on the island and he does it quite quickly and even stops himself from falling off at one point. That's right. But, it's, uh, yeah, it, it just goes to show how something big as this could actually bring in something so amazing. So all the characters get involved, it's a real kind of like a horror caper sort of thriller. Mm. Uh, it's an episode that showcases how ballsy Alan is. Like, mm. obviously you've got the, um, there's this, you know, unrelated um, subplot that's only about five minutes long which showcases Alan fixing the antenna on the um, island so that they can communicate with Thunderbird 5. And, you know, he's up there without a harness, without... I don't think he has a parachute, but he's just up there. You know, pretty ballsy. He must have a real head for heights. And then later on, when he's saving the people from the wrath of the giant alligators, he um, decides to lure the alligator away from the house by going out on the hover bike and luring it into a space where, you know, Virgil and Gordon can take it out with the cannon. And for what we've been debating, this episode really was Jerry Anderson's homage to all the uh, big uh, 
B-movie horrors around the time. I mean, it's the only episode that has an exclamation point in the title. And there's so much imagery to it that would make you think of really cheap horror, like uh, there's all the lighting and the setting, and there's one scene where you see this uh, housekeeper who, when we all watched this film, we all thought maybe she would turn into the villain because she looks so sinister. I mean, she looks like the woman in black, for God's sake. Yeah, sense. the way she's set up, she's this very sinister, very macabre kind of, you know, housekeeper who's very you know, talks in riddles almost, and there's a scene where she's literally on the stairs and lightning's behind her. And when you first watch it, you think, you know, maybe she'll be the villain. I mean, obviously you've got the giant alligators, but they're about as much the villains as the dinosaurs are in Jurassic Park. You've got to have a baddie in there. And the baddie turns out to be the boatman Culp, who's out to uh, steal the hormone and sell it out on the black market before it can be officially released. But we were, like, kind of thrown off thinking, oh, is she going to be the traitor? Because we saw her standing in front of uh, the lightning uh, strike-filled... Um, windows. So yeah, it's, it's uh, got some real Adams Family almost imagery to it, because she does remind me a little bit of Letitia Adams, but uh, who knows, really, who knows? I mean, I guess Jerry Ansem's kind of good at saying, oh, who's going to be the uh, villain? Maybe we'll throw in this imagery, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll use these cliches, it's try and make it as, as wacky as possible, you know, like we did with uh, Perils of Penelope. Yeah, and like you said, you know, the twist at the end with Culp coming back from the supposed dead and taking Scott and the others hostage, saying, all right, you guys, you know, if you don't let me get out of here, I'll pour some more of this growth hormone into the river and we'll have some more giant alligators, so you let me get out. And, you know, it almost seems like he's going to get away with it until there's one alligator, the, you know, an unlikely hero, the one alligator that they miss comes and just ravages the boat and tears him apart. Luckily, they managed to get the vial out of the swamp before it does create any more giant monsters. I guess there's another term where International Rescue did let someone die because he was posing to be so dangerous and thankfully Gordon saves it with the quick use of Thunderbird 4. Another thing we see this time is that uh, Thunderbird 2 is equipped with tranquilizer guns. It's as if uh, Brains may have been anticipating, you know, giant monsters or something, so maybe he just rigged up some tranquilizer guns overnight. But I don't think he may have been thinking of giant alligators. I would argue that why use tranq... I would say, you know, like a problem dog, you would have to put these things down. They pose such a massive threat to the ecosystem and, you know, the, the environment, you know. If, you, if these giant alligators are allowed to breed, you'll have them everywhere and they'll just pose such a massive threat to humanity, so maybe it is in the best interest of International Rescue to put them down. Uh, well, who knows, but I mean, International Rescue aren't, you know, a, an organisation that, uh, you know, takes people's lives. I mean, okay, they do have guns, but we can only presume that's if they're, if they're faced with, you know, um, you know, psychopaths with guns, like we saw in The Uninvited, like when a guy goes uh, gold, gold nuts. Gold fever, yeah. Yeah, it's real gold fever. So I guess, I guess really if they were ever had to like disperse, like say a riot or something, they'd have to fire tranquilizer guns instead of like a, a water cannon or something. I mean, how do we know that uh, Thunderbird 4 doesn't have like a water cannon or something? Mm. I like the setting, you know, this is one of, you know, you, you, we've explored all kinds of different settings through the course of the series. You know, you've got deserts, you've got cities, you've got jungles and stuff. And this one, you know, it's the Louisiana swamp. So, mm. and all, you've got all the smoke and the weeds and the trees and, you know, obviously the alligators and the wildlife. So it was a very interesting and unique setting. It's very difficult for uh, Thunderbird 2 to land as well. It does manage to land uh, the pod so uh, Gordon can get out in Thunderbird 4, but it's very difficult, uh, you know, to find such a secluded place. And what's more is that, it, look, it, the set design is so big in detail. The uh, house is so tucked away amongst all these amazing, you know, trees and marsh and bushes. It really looks quite believable. Mm, and of course in the lab as well. I think this would appeal to kids who were, you know, wanting to be chemists at heart. Because, you know, you've got that great get shot of, like, you know, the hormone being made and going through all the tubes and beakers and stuff. So maybe it appeals to kids with, um, you know, who played with chemistry sets as kids. But also, you know, there's, all, there's that blatantly obvious message there, which is don't fuck with nature. Don't yeah. tamper with nature. Don't play God. Because, you know, you may not end up with giant alligators, but you may end up damaging the environment. There's some elements to Frankenstein, or pretty much all those films Bella Lugosi was in, where he played uh, the mad scientist, like in Ed Wood, as yeah. you can see. Yeah, big mad scientist B-movie vibes. It was basically just a love letter to the 1950s horror of the time, I guess. Yeah, and so I guess maybe it inspired people to write Dexter's Lab, mm. or the like. And of course there's that um, very memorable ending where um, Tintin appropriately gets Alan 
a little pygmy alligator, um, a dwarf alligator, or mm. something like Do that for his birthday. Do those exist, pygmy alligators, or was that just some kind of portmanteau of small people and alligators? There's a species of caiman called dwarf caiman. They don't get much bigger than that, so maybe, you know, it could have been a dwarf caiman, or something yeah. like that. And I mean, as we said, there were plenty of double entendres in this show, but then we've got uh, the amazing line from Scott, which just threw it all out the water. Why, I know it's not your birthday until tomorrow, but come and see what I brought back for you. It's in the bathroom. The bathroom? <laughs> hey, what do you suppose Tintin wants to show Alan in the bathroom? That is just such an unsubtle, like, you know, I just grimaced re-watching. I was just like, how, how do you get away with something like that? You know, I can think of a couple of things Tintin would want to show Alan in the bathroom, but that's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I guess you would like to go to the bathroom with her as well, wouldn't you? She is a lovely girl! And just because I want to go scuba diving with her doesn't mean anything sexual. She's very uh, nice. <laughs> well, at least we had a lot of fun making uh, this episode because, you know, it was such a fun episode to watch. Yeah. We like animals, we like alligators, we like B-movies, we like horror, so yeah. It's just such a unique... I mean, aside from the controversy and the notoriety that's gained through the methods that they used on the animals, it's a very memorable episode. It is arguably the most memorable and unique episode of Thunderbirds because yeah. of how strange it is. But, you know, we loved it. He's been, it's been the one he's been most anticipating to review. Yeah, it's, it's just such a crazy episode. And it's probably the one that everybody remembers fondly. Yeah, we certainly remember this. We're going to remember it forever more now. Mm. Well, we've tackled alligators. Next episode, we'll be tackling aliens. So stick around for the next episode, Martian Invasion. F.A.B. F.A.B.